Symposium by Plato, The Speech of Diatema. When Aphrodite was born, the gods held a celebration. Poros, the son of Metis, was there among them. When they had feasted, Pinia came begging, as poverty does when there is a party, and stayed by the gates. Now Poros got drunk in nectar, there was no wine yet, you see, and feeling drowsy, went to the Garden of Zeus, where he fell asleep. Then Pinia schemed up this, a plan to relieve her lack of resources. She would get a child from Poros, so she lay beside him and got pregnant with love. That is why love is born to follow Aphrodite and serve her, because he was conceived on the day of her birth. And that's why he is also, by nature, a lover of beauty, because Aphrodite herself is especially beautiful. As the son of Poros and Penia, his lot of life is said to be like theirs. In the first place, he is always poor. He is far from being delicate and beautiful, as ordinary people think he is. Instead, he is tough and shriveled and shoeless and homeless, always lying in the dirt without a bed, sleeping people's doorsteps and roadsides under the sky, having his mother's nature, always living with need. But on his father's side, he is a schemer after the beautiful and the good. He is brave, impetuous, and intense, an awesome hunter, always weaving snares, resourceful in his pursuit of intelligence, a lover of wisdom through all his life, a genius with enchantments, potions, and clever pleadings. He is by nature neither immortal nor mortal, but now he springs to life when he gets his way. Now he dies, all in the very same day, because he is his father's son. However, he keeps coming back to life, but then anything he finds his way to always slips away, and for this reason... Love is never completely without resources, nor is he ever rich. He is in between wisdom and ignorance as well. In fact, you see, none of the gods loves wisdom or wants to become wise, for they are wise, and no one else who is wise already loves wisdom. On the other hand, no one who is ignorant will love wisdom either or want to become wise. What's especially difficult about being ignorant is that you are content with yourself, even though you are neither beautiful and good nor intelligent. If you don't think you need anything, of course you won't want what you don't think you need. In that case, Diotima, who are the people who love wisdom if they're neither wise nor ignorant? That's obvious, she said. A child could tell you. Those who love wisdom fall between those two extremes. And love is one of them, because he is in love with what is beautiful, and wisdom is extremely beautiful. It follows that love must be a lover of wisdom, and as such is in between being wise and being ignorant. This, too, comes to him from his parentage, from a father who is wise and resourceful, and a mother who is not wise and lacks resource. My dear Socrates, that then is the nature of the spirit called love. Considering what you thought about love, it's no surprise that you were led into thinking of love as you did. On the basis of what you say, I conclude that you thought love was being loved rather than being a lover. I think that's why love struck you as beautiful in every way, because it's, it is what is really beautiful and graceful that deserves to be loved, and this is perfect and highly blessed. But being a lover takes a different form, which I have just described. So I said, all right then, my friend. What you say about love is beautiful, but if you're right, what use is love to human beings? I'll try to teach you that, Socrates, after I finish this. So far, I've explained the character and the parentage of love. Now, according to you, he is love for beautiful things. But suppose someone asks us, Socrates and Diotima, what's the point of loving beautiful things? It's clear this way. The lover of beautiful things has a desire. What desire, what does he desire? That they become his own, I said. But that answer calls for still another question. That is, what will this man have for the beautiful things he wants have become his own? I said there's no way I could give a ready answer to that question. Then she said, suppose someone changes the question, putting good in a place of beautiful, and asked it this. Tell me, Socrates, the lover of good things has a desire. What does he desire? That they become his own, I said. And what will he have when the good things he wants have become his own? This time it's easier to come with the answer, I said. He'll have happiness. That's what makes happy people happy, isn't it? Possessing good things. There's no need to ask further. What's the point of wanting happiness? The answer you gave seems to be final. True, I said. And this desire for happiness, this kind of love. Do you think it's common to, to all human beings that everyone wants to have good things forever and ever? What would you say? Just that, I said. It is common to all. And Socrates, why don't we say that, love, that everyone is in love, she asked, since everyone always loves the same things. Instead, we say some people are in love and others not. Why is that? I wonder about that myself, I said. It's nothing to wonder about, she said. It's because we divide on a special kind of love. We refer to it by the word that means the whole, love, and for the other kinds of love we use other words. What do you mean, I asked. Well, you know, for example, that poetry has a very wide range which is used to mean creativity. After all, everything that is responsible for creating something out of nothing is a kind of poetry. And so all the creations of every craft or profession are themselves a kind of poetry, and everyone who practices a craft is a poet. True. Nevertheless, she said, as you also know, these craftsmen, craftsmen are not called poets. We have other words for them, and out of the whole of poetry, we have marked up one part, 
the part that uses give us with melody and rhythm, we refer to this by the word that means the whole. But this alone is called poetry. And those who practice this part of poetry are called poets. True. That's also how it is with love. The main point is this. Every desire for good things or for happiness is the supreme and treacherous love in everyone. But those who pursue this along any of its many other ways, through making money or through the love of sports or through philosophy, we don't say that these people are in love, and we don't call them lovers. It's only when people are devoted exclusively to one special kind of love that we use these words that really belong to the whole of it. Love and in love and lovers. I'm beginning to see your point, I said. Now there's a certain story, she said, according to which lovers are those people who speak, seek their other halves. But according to my story, a lover does not seek the half or the whole, unless, my friend, it turns out to be good as well. I say this because people are even willing to cut off their own arms and legs if they think they are diseased. I don't think an individual takes joy in what belongs to him personally, unless by belong to me, he means good. If I belong to another, he means bad. That's because what everyone loves is really nothing other than the good. Do you agree? Zeus, not I. Do you disagree? Zeus, not I. Now then, she said, can we simply say that people love the good? Yes, I said. But shouldn't we add that in loving it, they want the good to be theirs? We should. Not only that, she said, they want the good to be theirs forever, don't they? We should add that too. In a word then, love is wanting to possess the good forever. That's very true, I said. This then is the object of love, she said. In view of that, how do people pursue it if they are truly in love? What do they do at the eagerness and zeal we call love? What is the real purpose of love, can you say? If I could, I said, I wouldn't be your student, filled with admiration for your wisdom and trying to learn these very things. Well, I'll tell you, she said, it is giving birth in beauty, whether in body or in soul. It would take divination and to figure out what you mean. I can't. Well, I'll tell you more clearly, she said. All of us are pregnant, Socrates, both in body and in soul, and as soon as we come to a certain age, we naturally desire to give birth, and no one can possibly give birth in anything ugly, only in something beautiful. That's because when a man and a woman come together in order to give birth, this is a godly affair. Pregnancy, reproduction, this is an immoral thing for a mortal animal to do. It cannot occur in anything that is out of harmony, but ugliness is out of harmony with all that is godly. Beauty, however, is in harmony with the divine. Therefore, the goddess who resides at childbirth, she's called Mwara or Elthulia, is really beautiful. That's why, whenever pregnant animals or persons draw near to beauty, they become gentle and joyfully disposed and give birth and reproduce. But near ugliness, they are foul-faced and draw back in pain. They turn away and shrink back and do not reproduce. And because they hold on to what they carry inside them, the labor is painful. That is the source of the great excitement about beauty that comes to anyone who is pregnant and already teeming with life. Beauty releases them from their great pain. You see, Socrates, she said, what love wants is not beauty, as you think it is. Well, what is it then? Reproduction and birth and beauty. Maybe, I said. Certainly, she said. Now, why reproduction? It's because reproduction goes on forever. It is what mortals have in place of immortality. A lover must desire immortality along with the good. And if what we agreed earlier is right, that love wants to possess the good forever, it follows from our group that love must desire immortality. All this she taught me on those occasions when she spoke on the art of love. And once she asked, what do you think causes love and desire, Socrates? Don't you see that an awful state a wild animal is in when it wants to reproduce? Footed, footed and winged animals alike, all are plagued by the disease of love. First they are sick for intercourse with each other, then for nurturing their young. For their sake the weakest animals stand ready to do battle against the strongest, and even to die for them and they may be racked with famine in order to feed their young. They would do anything for their sake. Human beings, you think, would do this because they understand the reason for it. But what causes wild animals to be in such a state of love, can you say? And I said again that I didn't know. So, she said, how do you think you'll ever master the art of love if you don't know that? But that's why I came to you, Diatima, as I just said. I knew I needed a teacher, so tell me what causes this and everything else that belongs to the art of love. If you really believe that love by its nature aims at what we have often agreed it does, then don't be surprised at the answer, she said. For among animals, the principle is the same as with us, and mortal nature seeks so far as possible to live forever and be immortal. And this is possible in one way only, by reproduction, because it always leaves behind a new young one in place of the old. Even while each living thing is said to be alive and to be the same, as a person is said to be the same from childhood until he turns into an old man, even then, he never consists of the same things, though he is called the same, but he is always being renewed in other respects passing away, in his hair and flesh and bones and blood and his entire body. 
and it's not just in his body, but in his soul, too, for none of his manners, customs, opinions, desires, pleasures, pains, or fears ever remains the same, but some are coming to be in him while others are passing away. But what is still far stranger than that is that not only does one branch of knowledge come to be in his, in us while another passes away, and that we are never the same, even in respect to our knowledge, but that each single piece of knowledge has the same fate. What we call studying exists because knowledge is leaving us, because forgetting is the departure of knowledge, while studying puts back a fresh memory in place of what went away, thereby preserving a piece of knowledge so that it seems to be the same. And in that way, everything mortal is preserved, not like the divine, by always being the same in every way, because what is departing and aging leaves behind something new, something such as it had been. By this device, Socrates has said, what is mortal shares in immortality, whether it is a body or anything else, while the immortal has another way. So don't be surprised if everything naturally values its own offspring, because for the sake of immortality that everything shows a zeal, which is love. Yet when I heard her speech, I was amazed and spoke, Well, said I, most wise Diotima, is this really the way it is? In the manner of a perfect sophist, she said, be sure of it, Socrates. Look, if you will, at how any human being seeks honor, be amazed at their rationality. If you didn't have in mind what I spoke about, and if you hadn't pondered the awful state of love they're in, want to become famous and to lay up glory immortal forever, and how they're ready to brave any danger for the sake of this, much more than they are for their children. And they're prepared to spend money, suffer through all sorts of ordeals, and even die for the sake of glory. Do you really think that Alcestis would have died for Admetus, she, she asked? Or that Achilles would have died after Patroclus? Or that your Codros would have died so as to preserve the throne for his sons? If they hadn't expected the memory of their virtue, which we still hold in honor, to be immortal? Far from it, she said. I believe that anyone do, will do anything for the sake of immortal virtue and the glorious fame that follows. And the better the people, the more they will do, for they all are all in love with immortality. Now some people are pregnant in body, and for this reason turn more to women and pursue love in that way, providing themselves through childbirth with immortality and remembrance and happiness, as they think, for all time to come. While others are pregnant in soul, because they surely are those who are even more pregnant in their souls than in their bodies. And these are pregnant with what is fitting for a soul to bear and bring to birth. And what is fitting? Wisdom and the rest of virtue, which all poets beget, as well as all the craftsmen who are said to be creative. But by far the greatest and most beautiful part of wisdom deals with the proper ordering of cities and households, and that is called moderation and justice. When someone has been pregnant with these in his soul from early youth, while he is still a virgin, and having arrived at the proper age, desires to beget and give birth, he too will certainly go about seeking the beauty which he would beget, for he will never beget anything ugly. Since he is pregnant then, he is much more drawn to bodies that are beautiful than to those that are ugly. And if he also has the luck to find a soul that is beautiful and noble and well-formed, he is even more drawn to this combination. Such a man makes him instantly teem with ideas and arguments about virtue, the qualities a virtuous man should have, and the customary activities in which he should engage. And so he tries to educate him. In my view, you see, when he makes contact with someone beautiful and keeps company with them, he conceives and gives birth to what he has been carrying inside him for ages. Whether they are together or apart, he remembers that beauty. And in common with them, he nurtures the newborn. Such people, therefore, have much more to share than do the parents of human children, and have a firmer bond of friendship, because the children in whom they have a share are more beautiful and more immortal. Everyone would rather have such children than human ones, and would look up to Homer, Hesiod, and the other good poets with envy and admiration for the offspring they have left behind. Offspring, which, because they are immortal themselves, provide their parents with immortal glory and remembrance. For example, she said, those are the sort of children, like Kurgos, left behind in Sparta, the saviors of Sparta, and virtually all of Greece. Among you, the honor goes to Solon for his creation of your laws. Other men in other places everywhere, Greek or barbarian, have brought a host of beautiful deeds into the light and begotten every kind of virtue. Already many shrines have sprung up to honor them for their mortal children, which hasn't happened yet to anyone for her human offspring. Even you, Socrates, could probably come to be initiated into these rites of love. And as for the purpose of these rites when they are done correctly, that is the final and highest mystery, and I don't know if you are capable of it. I myself will tell you, she said, and I won't stint any effort, and you must try to follow if you can. <clears throat> a lover who goes about this matter correctly must begin in his youth to devote himself to beautiful bodies. First, if the leader leads a right, he should love one body and beget beautiful ideas there. That he should realize that the beauty of any one body is brother to the beauty of any other, and that if he is to pursue beauty of form, he'd be very foolish not to think that the beauty of all bodies is one of the same. 
When he grasps this, he must become a lover of all beautiful bodies, and he must think that this wild gaping after just one body is a small thing and despise it. After this, he must think that the beauty of people's souls is more valuable than the beauty of their bodies, so that if someone is decent in his soul, even though he is scarcely blooming in his body, our lover must be content to love and care for him, and to seek that to give birth to such ideas as will make young men better. The result is that our lover will be forced to gaze at the beauty of activities and laws, and to see that all this is akin to itself, with the result that he will think that the beauty of bodies is a thing of no importance. After customs, he must move on to various kinds of knowledge. The result is that he will see the beauty of knowledge and be looking mainly not at beauty in a single example, as a serpent would, would who favored the beauty of a little boy or a man or a single custom, being a slave, of course, he's low and small-minded. But the lover is turned to the great sea of beauty, and gazing upon this, he gives birth to many gloriously beautiful ideas and theories in unstinting love of wisdom, until, having grown up and strengthened there, he catches sight of such knowledge and is the knowledge of such beauty. Try to pay attention to me, she said, as best as you can. You see... The man who has been thus far guided in matters of love, who has beheld beautiful things in the right order and correctly, is coming now to the goal of loving. All of a sudden he will catch sight of something wonderfully beautiful in its nature. That, Socrates, is the reason for all his earlier labors. First, it always is, and neither comes to be nor passes away, neither waxes nor wanes. Second, it is not beautiful this way and ugly that way, nor beautiful one time and ugly at another, nor beautiful in relation to one thing and ugly in relation to another. Nor is it beautiful here, but ugly there, as it would be if it were beautiful for some people and ugly for others. Nor will the beautiful appear to him in the guise of a face or hands or anything else that belongs to the body. It will not appear to him as one idea or one kind of knowledge. It is not anywhere in another thing, as in an animal or in earth or in heaven or in anything else, but itself by itself with itself. It is always one in form, and all the other beautiful things share in that, in such a way that when those others come to be or pass away, this does not become the least bit smaller or greater, nor, su nor suffer any change. So when someone rises by these stages, through loving boys correctly, and begins to see this beauty, he has almost grasped his goal. This is what it is to go aright, or to be led by another, into the beauty of love. One goes always upwards for the sake of this beauty, starting out from beautiful things, using them like rising stairs, from one body to two, or from two to all beautiful bodies, and then from beautiful bodies to beautiful customs, from customs to learning beautiful things, and from these lessons he arrives in the end of this lesson, which is learning of this very beauty, so that in the end he comes to know just what it is to be beautiful. And there in life, Socrates, my friend, said the moment from Mantinea, there, if anywhere, should a person live his life, beholding that beauty. If you once see that, it won't occur to you to measure beauty by gold or clothing or beautiful boys and youths, but if you see them now, strike you out of your senses and make you, you and many others, eager to be with the boys you love and look at them forever. If there were any way to do that, forgetting food and drink, everything but looking at them and being with them. But how would it be, in, in our view, she said, if someone got to see the beautiful itself, absolute, pure, unmixed, not polluted by human flesh or colors or any other great nonsense of mortality, but if he could see the divine beauty itself in its one form, do you think it would be a poor life for a human being to look there and to behold it? by that which he ought and to be with it or haven't you remembered she said then that life alone when he looks at beauty in the only way that beauty can be seen only then will it become possible for him to give birth not to images of virtue because he's in touch with the no images but to true virtue because he's in touch with the true beauty the love of the gods belongs to anyone who has given birth to true virtue and nourished it and if any human being could become immortal it would be he this phaedrus and the rest of you was what diotina told me I was persuaded, and once persuaded, I tried to persuade others, too, that human nature can find no better workmate for acquiring this than love. And that's why I say that every man must honor love, why I honor the rights of love myself, and practice them with special diligence, and why I commend them to others. Now and always I praise the power and courage of love, so far as I am able. Consider this speech, then, Phaedrus, if you wish, a speech in praise of love, or if not, call it whatever and however you please to call it.